Um, so, three, two, one. Good evening. Welcome to the first sitting of the Ignorant Art School, Five Sittings Towards Creative Emancipation. I'm Sophia Howe, and I'm here with my friends and colleagues, Peter Amo, Eileen Daly, Ruth Ewan, Erin Farley, John McCann, Hussein Misa, Alison Scott, and uh, Sean Toland. It's fantastic to see so many of you here this evening for this history class, the launch event of our new school. This history class, an A to Z of Dandonian descent, will be presented by our first sitting artist, Ruth Yuan, storyteller, Erin Farley, historian, Siobhan Toland, and the tool of the Ignorant Art School collaborators, playwright, John McCann, and the writer, Hussein Misa, alongside the contributors from our invite, uh, contributions from our invited guests. So following the class, I will return to share some of the ideas underscoring the Ignorant Art School. My colleagues, Alison, Eileen, and Peter will be working behind the scenes to ensure the smooth running of the class. If you would like to uh, get in touch with us or leave your comments, please use the chat box to the right on your screen or email us at exhibitions at dundee.ac.uk. So now, without further ado, I shall give the floor to Ruth, Erin, and Schwann. Yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Ruth Ewan and thank you so much to all of you for joining us this evening for our history class, an A to Z of Dundonian descent. This event sees the launch of the Cooper Gallery's Ignorant Art School project and it acts as a prelude to my forthcoming exhibition which will open in September. Finding a way to make site responsive artwork this year without being able to visit the actual site or relating archives has been an unusual form of challenge. However, this A to Z is not the start, but a continuation of a thread of research into Dundee's radical history, which began for me initially over 10 years ago with the exhibition Brank and Heckel at DCA. Working recently with the Cooper Gallery, this has offered me the opportunity to pick up and expand this research, reconnect with historian Siobhan Tolland, who along with storyteller Erin Farley, I have collaborated with to create tonight's alphabet. Friends, old and new, will join us along the way with readings from Hussein Mitha, John McGann, Sarah Divine, Tandine Byrne, Poppy Page. We're excited to include three specially recorded songs from Tayo Aluko, Karen Casey, and Lorraine Wilson with Tosh Flood. Thank you also to the artist Stella Rooney, who has generously contributed images relating to the Timex strike tonight. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank the team at the Cooper Gallery. Alison, Eileen, Peter and Sophia, who have worked so hard from home to make this event possible. Packed with stories and anecdotes, this evening's history class offers a virtual glance at just some of the people who've attempted to playfully and provocatively challenge past and present powers in Dundee. It is a history full of very particular words and deeds. These words and deeds form a distinct creative grammar of dissent which continue to challenge and shape the future of the city and the world beyond it. This list is by no way conclusive or exhaustive. We could have gone through the alphabet several times over and we invite you through the chat box to make further suggestions. So to get us started, I'm pleased to present Dundee's very own Lorraine Wilson and Tosh Flood with a special version of the alphabet song by Michael Mara. Say it backwards I know the consonant 
feeds me daily It gets me to my sentences end In an elegant way I know it comes to my defense When those hooligan teams go by It cuts down my expense I choose my words well The artist Ian Hamilton Finlay once said in an interview that he couldn't talk about Scotland because it cast a shadow across his heart. In response, Michael Mara, whose song we've just heard, said Dundee shone like a light across his. And through visit, revisiting this city, albeit virtually, I think I understand why he said this. And so let's begin our alphabet with the letter A. A is for anonymous. Not the international collective activists, which we may well in fact have members of here in Dundee, but the figures without a given name who have attempted to alter the face of the city around them. Within the rich folk tradition of Dundee and the surrounding area, hundreds of ballads have been passed down through the generations. It is the oral tradition of the cult and the culture of the commons before and after widespread literacy. The songs of Dundee chart the people adapting and surviving to the brutal realities of working class life from pre to post industrialization It is a living tradition that chronicles history and dialect from below, from the farmers and ploughmen to the workers of the clipper feet, fleets, the whaling ships, to the female mill workers, to the crippling poverty of the 1930s, to the house clearances of the 60s and 70s. These largely anonymous ballads present a pluralistic, unsanitized and body slice of city life that no single historic account could. As the Fren French folklorist Sylvain Trebuch once said, the people have their archives and these are the songs. Anonymous are also the activists and agitators whose names we do not know. They are the witches accused, the rioters battered and bruised, the maidservants strikers, the hecklers, the mass groaners, the egg throwers, the whistle blowers, the pop bangers, the jingle ring dancers, liberty tree planters, class war farers, green hat wearers, the slogan writers, the pavement chalkers, the bread rioters, the chartist marchers, the suffrage supporters, the window smashers, the political gate crashers, the banner makers, the oil rig scalers, the equal pay fighters, the pride face painters and the Black Lives Matter campaigners and many more who wish to remain anonymous. B is for Mary Brooks Bank. Mary Brooks Bank was a Dundee poet, songwriter, folk singer and political activist. Born in Aberdeen in 1897, she began her work in life in the Dundee Jute Mills at the age of 12. And it was in those mills that she penned her most famous song, 
the Jutmal song, still sung across the world to this day. Mary lived in bitter and difficult times, living through both world wars as well as the Depression, where Dundee fared particularly bad. Dundee's huge level of poverty has marched the city for many generations, and it was women like Mary who became the voice of concern and opposition against such appalling deprivation. Mary saw herself as being a voice of and for the people of Dundee, a city often hungry and desperate, but with beauty, clarity, resilience and determination, values that have divined Dundonians for many centuries. In 1968, when the revolution marched across the globe, Mary penned her autobiography as a note of solidarity to the youngsters who were pushing the radical reforms that the 60s brought us. Mary experienced decades of struggle and political battles and her message to the new generation of revolutionaries was that the gains we make can become so easily lost. Mary wanted her life to be an example of what we can achieve through political action, but what can so easily be lost if we don't continue to fight for social justice, generation upon generation. Mary Brooksbank is internationally known for her folk songs and she sits as a voice of the Scottish folk revival. For Dundee activists, however, she also became an icon of social justice and equality. Mary Brooksbanks was an exceptional woman, but in many ways there are millions of Marys across the world, creative, determined women, always fighting for a better society. If there is one voice, vo verse of Mary's poetry that can sum this up, it's this, politicians and rulers are richly rewarded, but in this one woman's life is our history recorded. C is for Lila Clunas. Lila Clunas was a primary school teacher at Brown Street School in the centre of Dundee, and she was one of the city's most active suffragettes. She was secretary of the Dundee Women's Freedom League, and she'd been on hunger strike in prison after she was arrested at a protest in Westminster. When she was back in Dundee, Clunas and her colleagues kept the heat on their MP Winston Churchill over his lack of support for women's suffrage. You see, Churchill reassured them that he did believe in the principles of female suffrage, just not to the extent that he was going to actually vote for the bill which would secure it. This was not good enough, and Lila knew it. But Churchill stopped engaging with them. He evaded their questions, and he started having his stewards throw Lila out of the public liberal meetings whenever she pressed him. And soon they started throwing her out before she got anywhere near the room. The Freedom League was told they had to get in church with Churchill by post. He probably thought a letter would be easy to ignore. So Lila Clunas wrote Winston Churchill's Dundee address on a card, pinned it to the front of her shirt and presented herself at the post office. She paid the express letter fee of three pence and a telegraph boy escorted her round to his house. Churchill didn't have the courage to face his delivery and he pretended not to be at home. But Clunas's determination and humour struck a chord with many women in Dundee. Towards the end of her life in the 1960s, Lila thought back on her days as a suffragette. She said, I was just lying there thinking about Winston Churchill and how horrible he was to me. I made him see me once in his office and when I went in, he just glared at me with these prominent eyes of his. And I thought to myself, no descendant of Sarah Jennings is going to get the better of me. So I glared back. God help Churchill in the afterlife. D is for Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass was born into slavery in Maryland, USA in February 1818. In 1838, disguised as a sailor, he escaped and fled to New York, gaining his freedom. He wrote of his experience of emancipation 
Anguish and grief, like darkness and rain, may be depicted, but gladness and joy, like the rainbow, defy the skill of a pen or pencil. Douglas began to attend abolitionist meetings in Massachusetts, where he had settled with his wife. Through telling his life story at these meetings, he gained a reputation for his oratory and eloquence. In 1843, he joined the American Anti-Slavery Society's 100 Conventions Project and embarked on a six month speaking tour throughout the United States. In 1845, Douglas set sail for Britain and Ireland. He spoke at four meetings in Dundee in January, 1846. The first three were so crowded that tickets had to be issued for his last speech. His speeches in Scotland were wry attacks on the free church, which was receiving funding from American slaveholders. Scotland is a blaze of anti-slavery agitation. The free church and slavery are all engrossing topics, he wrote. Douglas often spoke fondly of how the working class of Britain and Ireland accepted and welcomed him in contrast to the deeply segregated society of the United States. An edited extract from The Free Church of Scotland and American Slavery, an address delivered in Dundee on January 30th, 1846. Does the Free Church represent your views on the question of slavery? Cries from the audience, no, no. I am glad to hear it. They claim to be the model the impersonation, the life and soul of Christianity in this country. Well, with all these influences and with their exceedingly tender consciences, laughter from the audience, and with professions of love to God and man, they leave their homes and go to the United States and strike hands in good Christian fellowship with men whose hands are full of blood, the coats, the boots, the watches, the houses, and all they possess are the result of unpaid toil of the poor, fettered, stricken and branded slave. Let the people of Scotland arise and show the free church that they do not represent them. Let the voice of public opinion compel that church to send back the money. E is for Ethel Moorhead. Ethel was an artist and a suffragette. Moving to Dundee at the turn of the 20th century, she became well-known working portrait artist within the city, exhibiting in many prestigious exhibitions across Scotland and gaining a reputation for innovation and creativity. In 1910, Ethel joined the Dundee Women's Social and Political Union, one of the main suffragette organisations of the time. She soon gained the reputation as being one of its most turbulent activists, beginning her notoriety by trying to egg Winston Churchill that same year. Her political action only increased in pace and severity. By 1912, she was down in London with nine other Dundee women, smashing windows across the city in defiance and protest for the rights of women to vote. Ethel continued her activity across Scotland been imprisoned many times for more window smashing as well as arson and assault. It was even rumoured she tried to bomb Robert Burns's cottage, all in the name of Votes for Women. Unfortunately for Ethel, however, she also became the first suffragette to be force fed within Scotland. Arrested for outstanding charges and resisting arrest, she immediately went on hunger strike and was force fed for four days solid. The incident was met with horror by many across Scotland, with commentators remarking that this was a blight on Scottish society, that we could treat such an activist and a woman so awfully. This was something that was not seen as would happen within Scotland. Ethel was eventually released because of illness, having contracted pneumonia, she says, as a result of the force feeding. What it did do, however, was galvanise the Scottish suffragette movement, who stood to her defence standing outside the prison and marching regularly in support of Ethel and support for all women advancing the vote. Ethel became a rallying call for the Scottish suffragette movement and she was literally a force of nature within it. In the 1920s, Ethel moved to Paris where she edited one of the most respected literary art journals of the time, publishing the works of James Joyce, Hemingway and Pound. 
Ethel Moorhead encapsulates a mix of resilience, creativity, and a sense of social justice that seems to mark the rich history of Dundee. F is for fighting fascism. In 1936, General Franco, with support from Hitler and Mussolini, overthrew the democratically elected Spanish government with a fascist regime. There was no response from the British government, but the Communists and Independent Labour Party responded with international brigades. Around two and a half thousand workers from across Britain volunteered to go and support the people of Spain in their fight against fascism. Well over a hundred of these were from Dundee. They made their way down to London on trains, joining comrades from Fife, Edinburgh and beyond. And from there they crossed to Paris using a weekend ticket which did not ask for a passport. They crossed the French border on foot and went onwards into Spain. Many did not return and still others fought up until 1939 when Franco finally defeated the resistance and then signed up to the British army to fight Hitler's forces in World War II. And the fight went on at home as well. The Dundee Spanish aid movement were constantly fundraising. They bought and sent an ambulance to the front. And in 1937, the bombing of Guernica led the Dundee Spanish aid movement to set up a home to look after Basque refugee children who had lost homes and families in the bombing. A host of local organisations, the Trades Council, the Bakers Union, the Women's Liberal Association got on board. The Dundee School of Music held a fundraising concert in the Caird Hall. In the end, they didn't find a suitable building in Dundee, but they raised money to purchase Mull Park House in Montrose. The first children arrived there in late September 1937, and 25 young Basque children were given safety and shelter there. The 16 men from Dundee who were lost in the Spanish Civil War are commemorated with a plaque outside the McManus galleries. G is for George, and there are three of these. George Loch, the radical laird, was Dundee's first MP, elected to Parliament in 1832. His statue sits next that sits next to the McManus galleries. He spent time in France during the revolution which influenced his political outlook. The statue's plaque highlights Kinloch's progressive role as a British parliamentary reformer, but it doesn't acknowledge that the wealth of the Kinloch family was derived from slavery. His father had inherited a plantation in Jamaica years before. Kinloch publicly stated himself to be an enemy of slavery in all its forms although it is worth noting he was campaigning for office at this time. His statue is one of many across the UK detailed on the website topplatheracists.org and is currently the subject of review within the local community. Our second George is the Reverend George Gilfillan, who was a leading figure in the religious and cultural networks of mid 19th century Dundee. A poet, author, editor and critic, Publishing his own work extensively, he also championed the poetry of working class women, including the factory girl Ellen Johnson and Janet Hamilton. He may be most remembered for his promotion of William McGonagall, supposedly Britain's worst poet. Across Dundee, Gilfillan was involved in many educational progressive political campaigns, such as the Literary Societies Union, the Anti-Corn Laws Association, the Voluntary Anti-State Association, the Friends of Italy and the Working Men's Association. His wife, Margaret, was president of the Dundee Ladies Anti-Slavery Association and the National Society for Promoting Women's Suffrage. George number three is the Scottish martyr and radical reformer, George Mealmaker, born in 1768. A handling weaver by trade, who with Thomas Fish Palmer found, founded the group Dundee Friends of Liberty. In 1793, 
Mealmaker wrote a pamphlet entitled Dundee Address to the Friends of Liberty that criticised the tyranny of the British government and opposed the war with France. On the 12th of September, Fish Palmer was arrested and charged with writing the pamphlet. The authorities claimed it was calculated to produce a spirit of discontent in the minds of the people against the present happy constitution and governments of this country and to rouse them up to acts of outrage and violence. Mealmaker gave evidence at the trial that it was he and not Palmer who had in fact written it. Despite this, Palmer was found guilty and sentenced to be transported to Australia. Mealmaker continued to campaign for universal suffrage, writing and publishing radical tracts. He was finally charged with sedition and sentenced to 14 years transportation in 1798. Forced to leave behind his wife and daughters in Dundee, he died from alcoholism 10 years after transportation. Hussein will now read an extract from Mealmaker's pamphlet, Dundee Address to the Friends of Liberty. Is not every day adding a new link in our chains? Is not the executive branch seizing new and warrantable powers? Has not the House of Commons, your only security from the evils of tyranny and aristocracy, joined the coalition against you? Is the election of its members either fair, free or frequent? Is not its independence gone while it has made up of pensions and placemen? You are plunged into a war by a wicked ministry and a compliant parliament who seem careless and unconcerned for your interest, the end and design of which is almost too horrid to relate, the destruction of a people merely because they will be free. By your commerce is sore cramped and almost ruined. Thousands of your fellow citizens from being in a state of prosperity are reduced to a state of poverty and misery. Eight, Half Loaf, The Bread Riots of 1816. Half loaf is a very Dundee word. It literally means a loaf of bread. It come from originally being a smaller loaf of bread, a cheaper loaf, but for Dundee, it literally just means a loaf of bread. Throughout history, the half loaf has become the spark of political action and protest. From the storming of Bastille in 1789, to the Arab Springs in 2010, the shortage of bread has become a revolutionary, a driver of revolutionary fervor. The bread riots of 1816 was an example of this, with the Dundee part of the national and international revolt. Considered as the year without summer, poor weather and crop shortages led to a huge increase in the price of wheat and therefore bread across Europe. Starvation and disease marked these years as the basic staple became out of the reach of ordinary people. Riots occurred in France, in Suffolk, Norfolk and Cambridgeshire, and of course in Dundee. The riot started when a local oatmeal seller raised his price by 10%. This was the final straw for many Dundonians, who marched through the town with an effigy of the seller and accusing grain sellers generally of exploiting their suffering. It soon descended into a riot with around a thousand people burning and looting stores for food. Around a hundred stores were said to have been looted during those riots, as well as some of the homes of the grain sellers. And the rioting only stopped after reassurances from the people of Dundee that they would help out those who were hungry. This event has been marked as one of the most significant moments of that time and it marked a chapter of Dundee history where it sits again at the heart of a national and international rebellion. The half loaf is sustenance, and for many it is literally life, but the notion of bread has taken on symbolic significant value, becoming a global metaphor for political action against poverty, hunger and inequality. I is for Ireland. On the 5th of September, on the 
5th of September 1881, over 2,000 people, mostly young Irish female mill workers, squeezed into Dundee's Kinnaird Hall on Bank Street to hear Anna Parnell speak. Parnell, leader of the Irish Ladies Land League, had arrived in Scotland to rally emigrant communities in support of the agitation to protest police brutality, to lower rents, stop evictions, and end landlordism in Ireland. The Ladies Land, an auxiliary of the Irish National Land League, was created to ensure agitation could continue once male Land League leaders were imprisoned, which they duly were less than one month after Anna Parnell spoke that September night in Dundee. As we shall soon hear, Anna reserved her warmest praise for the city, which at that time had an Irish community comprising twice as many women as men, a highly distinctive demographic in the Irish diaspora. First established in New York in 1880, the Irish Ladies Land League soon had branches across Ireland, the USA, Britain, Canada and Australasia. An unprecedented advance in Irish women's political activism in Dundee, a transnational movement translated into a specific setting where immigrants' activism was shaped by class, gender and religion. Speakers like Parnell and the availability of national and international newspapers connected branches in Dundee with the wider world of the Irish land reform movement. In Scotland, the work of the Irish National and Ladies Land Leagues directly inspired the creation of the Highland Land League and Crofters Party, which went on to secure five parliamentary seats in its campaign to reform land law here. Anna Parnell's speech was reported in the Dundee Weekly News on the 10th of September, 1881. The extract you're about to hear is adapted from this report and is read by Sarah Diviny. Ladies, I do not know whether it is necessary to say gentlemen, because I find that this evening they are kept in a state of proper subjection. This town was the first in Scotland which sent the Ladies' Land League in Ireland any help, and therefore, no matter what other cities in Scotland might boast of, you in Dundee would always know that you were the first to send help, because you have my word for it. The Provost of Greenock said that Gladstone and Bright have done so much for Ireland. What kind of Scotsman is he to tell us what Gladstone and Bright have done for Ireland? What does he know about Ireland? The Provost said that our unseemingly clamour, I suppose he meant more especially mine, would alienate the people of England and Scotland from their Irish brethren. I do not know that the alienation of English and Scotch people from the Irish could be any more greater than it is. If the government of India by England were to result in a constant flood of Hindu coolies to drive the English working men out of their own markets and cut their wages in two to keep them always at starvation point, then I do not believe that the English working people would tolerate the government of India by the English. And this was the result of the government of Ireland by England. And yet, the English working people not only tolerate it, but a good many of them gave their lives to keep it up. Of course, it is very well for people holding elected positions to try and identify themselves a little with the Irish in order to get some Irish votes when they require them. We are now approaching a general election. There can be scarcely any doubt that the word will be passed around to every place where there was an Irish voter or a man who had a vote and who had an Irish wife to vote against those benefactors in Ireland, Mr Gladstone and Mr Bright. These Scotch Whig politicians must be taught that the Irish know the difference between deeds and words, that they know how to remember treachery and to punish it. Two men shot in Cork and two men shot in Limerick were four of Mr Gladstone's most recent benefits. Let you, however, be satisfied that for every one of us Mr Gladstone shot, 
there was one of his men knocked over at the polls in England. They must remember that the Irish men and women of England and Scotland had a power that their forefathers never dreamt of, and they must be sure to use it right. J. J is for a Duke Mill song. Siobhan has introduced us already tonight to Mary Brooks Bank. The Duke Mill song written by Mary is, a we is very well known on the folk circuit and beyond. The Canongate Wall, part of the Scottish Parliament, features 26 quotes. An extract from this song is the only quote attributed to a woman on this wall. Mary crafted the Duke Mill song around a verse of work song, which she had picked up in the mills, which became the song's chorus. To this, she added the verses, inspired by the plight of her fellow female shifters who struggled to feed and clothe their children with their weekly wages. Mary's notebook containing the song's lyrics are held within Dundee University's archive. I'm delighted to share with you this evening a beautiful version of the Duke Mill song by Irish singer Karen Casey, recorded especially for tonight's event. Oh, dear me, the mill runs fast and the poor wee shifters can't get their rest. Shifting barbers coarse and fine, they fairly make you work for your ten and nine. And oh dear me, I wish the day was done, running up and down the path is no fun. Shift and piece and spin and warp, weft and twine, to feed and clothe your parents of a ten and a nine. And oh dear me, the mill runs fast, the poor wee shifters can't get their rest. Shift and barbers coarse and fine, they fairly make you work for your ten and nine. And oh dear me, the world is ill divided, then that work the hardest are the least provided. But I'm all bite contented, dark days are fine, there's lay much pleasure. Out of ten and nine And oh dear me The mill runs fast And the poor we shifters Can't get them rest Shift and barbers coarse and fine they fairly make you work out of ten and nine. They fairly make you work out of ten and nine. Thank you. K is for kettle boiler. Kettle boiler is literally a kettle boiler, someone who boils the kettle. In Dundee, however, it means a man who would stay at home and look after the household when his wife went out to work. The rise of the jute mills in the 1850s brought many women into the city of Dundee. As Dundee's main industry, women outnumbered men in the jute mills by three to one and that made Dundee very much a woman's town.
The kettle biler then was a situation where the women worked, but the men, because they struggled to find work, would hang around inside the home. Women would become the breadwinner and men would stay at home biling the kettle, making the tea. There's not much evidence to suggest that men did the housework, however. It seems that most women often worked and then did their domestic chores when they came home. In a woman's town, though, kettle bilers became synonymous of a culture that challenged the traditional norm of what work meant and what masculinity and femininity meant. Work was not the traditional male employ as was often assumed. In Dundee, work was just as much the domain of women as it was of met for men, and domesticity was just as much the domain of men. Kettle Biler then reflects the quintessentially Dundonian tradition of doing things just that little bit differently, and it flipped the notion of gender and work on its head. L is for Liberty Tree. During the French Revolution, the Tree of Liberty was a powerful symbol of the rights of the people. In 1793, the Dundee Radicals and the Friends of Liberty, led by a shoemaker named Downey, set out to plant a Tree of Liberty in Dundee. They made for the gardens of Belmont House, a large house on the Perth Road, which had recently been laid out with newly planted trees and flowers, where they found an ash tree. They took this tree back to the city centre and planted it near the Market Cross. This was in the days before paving slabs had been laid in the city centre. And they decorated the tree with a very Dundonian choice of rolls, biscuits and oranges. And they held a celebratory bonfire crying liberty, equality and fraternity. The provost at that time was a man named Alexander Riddich, and by that point he was quite unpopular for the way that he had hamstrung democracy in the city over his time in office. When Riddich came out to inspect the goings on, the Friends of Liberty dragged him into the dance and they would not let him go until he joined in the call for liberty. But the next day, Provost Riddich showed the tree who was boss. He had the city guards dig it up and they threw it into the thief's hole in Dundee jail, thus achieving history as the only civic head in the world to have jailed a tree. And then it stayed for a few days until it had served its sentence and was released to be replanted once more in the grounds of Belmont House. And this ash tree lived there for well over another century, but it was lost in 1930s renovations. But the title of Tree of Liberty continues. There is another designated Tree of Liberty in the garden of Duncan of Jordanston, not far away from the Cooper Gallery, with a plaque telling its story. Go and seek out the Liberty Tree next time you're in the area. M. Um, M is for Loudon McCartney, also known as Alvin Marlaw. Loudon McCartney was born in Dundee in 1863. He'd worked in the Duke Mills and as a journalist for the Dundee Advertiser and Weekly News before taking over the poet's box on the Overgate. A vibrant working class autodidactic culture surrounds the poet's box. The shop operated from 1880 and McCartney ran it for 40 years from 1906. It was small and crowded with a printing press operating from a gaslit back room. There were stacks of poetry books and song sheets for sale. The poet's box was particularly busy on local holidays known as market days when workers from the nearby rural area came into the city. McCartney specialised in local songs and bothy ballads as well as publishing many Irish songs to cater for the immigrant workforce. The shop stocked the anarchist newspaper Freedom and McCartney offered contraceptive advice to local men. He organised informal gatherings known as penny readings at a time when many people in the city were illiterate. McCartney also invited political speakers to the city, including Guy Aldred, 
who first visited in 1913. Under the pen name Alvin Marlaw, McCartney published The Use and Significant, Significance of Strikes in the 1904 issue of Voice of Labour. He also published Through the Poets Box, a parody of Coleridge's lyrical ballad, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, as the rhyme of the ancient Harridan. The idea behind Marlowe's parody is to illustrate what he saw as a brutal truth, that the rich pay taxes and bribes in order to maintain power and privilege, whilst the workers remain trapped in a cycle of poverty, discriminated against in law. N. N is for Neddy Scrimger. Edwin Scrimger, affectionately known as Neddy by Dundonians, was a leftist prohibitionist and was to date the only MP in Westminster ever to be elected on a prohibitionist platform. But Neddy was much more than the leader of the Scottish temperance movement. He was a religious preacher, trade union supporter and socialist. He worked closely with Dundee's trade unionist and eventual Communist Party member Bob Stewart, employing him as his full-time organiser in the early years. Neddy maintained close relations with the Labour movement within Dundee, and in the 1922 general election, the Labour Party gave support for Scrimger by fielding only one of two possible candidates. That cooperation between Neddy and the Labour Party allowed the Prohibitionist Party to oust Winston Churchill. With an election slogan of vote as you pray, Neddy represented the people of Dundee for nine years, eventually being ousted by Florence Horsburgh in 1931. Neddy Scrimger reflects a Dundee that takes that wee bit of a different path. His ousting of Churchill and his prohibitionist trade unionism made him a rather unique representative for a city that tries to forge a different social and political path. Neddy is immortalised in the following ditty. Vote, vote, vote for Neddy Scrimger. He's the man to give you ham and eggs. If you didn't vote for him, he will bash your windies in and you'll never see your windies anymore. O is for oration. There's a long history of public speaking in Dundee. Street performers were a common sight in the city, singing, reciting and holding forth on all manner of topics. The Overgate, the Green Market and the foot of the Hilltown were hot spots for public speech and debate, and so were the networks of halls across the city. And most of our characters tonight were known for their public speaking. A lot of them faced backlash, especially the women. When Fanny Wright, who we're going to meet later on, moved to America, she was mocked in cartoons like this one. Not for the substance of her words, but for being a woman speaking at all. But the right to speak does mean the right to challenge what people say as well. And heckling is a good old Dundee tradition too. The word comes from the textile industry and it means to tease out the flax or jute fibres to make them suitable for processing. Tradition has it that it got its current meaning in the early 19th century when handloom weaving sheds were political debating chambers and literary salons. In the early factories, the hecklers would take turns to stand up and read the day's news while their colleagues worked. And as they worked, they would listen and shout their objections and questions at the speaker. Heckling was one of several things that Churchill dreaded about Dundee. An Irish suffragette named Mary Maloney was his nemesis during the 1908 by-elections. She would interrupt his speeches to demand to know why he refused to support women's suffrage. And when he refused to answer or tried to fob her off, she began to ring the handbell that she carried with her, drowning out the rest of his speech. She became fondly known by Dundonians as La Belle Maloney.
P is for Paul Robeson, which is brought to you by Tayo Aluko. Hello, my name is Tayo Aluko, and the letter for the Dondonian descent A to Z is P, and the name Paul Robeson is the one I want to share with you. Paul, I believe, was in Dundee performing at the Curd Hall on a Monday in 1937. He would have filled all the thousands of seats on that day, um, either before or after going to the Royal Albert Hall to make a speech on behalf of the Spanish Republicans, the Spanish Socialists in the Civil War against the fascist uh, government of Franco. So this was this huge star who was using his platform as a socialist to call for human rights around the world. And when I performed in Dundee Rep uh, in 2012, March 2012, I probably got about 200 people watching, but I used the occasion to draw attention to the fact that Paul Robeson's struggles were still very relevant uh, to that day and today. So then we were in the news was the death of Trayvon Martin killed by George Zimmerman who was uh, still at large at, the, at that time. Um, today we have the same problems and it is behoven on all of us to use whatever platform we have to continue to speak truth to power and to fight for civil and human rights in whatever way we can. Uh, Paul Robeson's fa favorite song was about Joe Hill, a Scandinavian immigrant to the United States who was a powerful trade unionist who used music to galvanize workers and he was so effective that he was uh, decidedly a thorn in the flesh and the copper bosses uh, framed him on a murder charge and uh, he was executed uh, in 1915. He is supposed to have said on his uh, as he was waiting to be shot to the miners who had gathered to mourn, don't mourn for me, organize. And this is the song that was written about him. <clears throat> I dreamed I saw Joe Hill last night, alive as you and me. Says I, but Joe, you're ten years dead. I never died, says he. I never died, says he. Salt Lake Joe, by Jove, I says, him standing by my bed. They framed you on a murder charge, says Joe, but I ain't dead, says Joe, but I ain't dead. The copper bosses killed you, Joe, they shot you, Joe, says I, takes more than guns to kill a man. Says Joe, I didn't die. Says Joe, I didn't die. And standing there as big as life and smiling with his eyes, he says those they forgot to kill went on to organize went on to organize. Joe Hill ain't dead, he says to me. Joe Hill ain't never died. We're working folk are out on strike. Joe Hill is at their side. Joe Hill is at their side. From San Diego to Dundee, in every mine and mill, where working folk defend their rights, that's where you'll find Joe Hill. 
That's where you find Joe Hill. I dreamed I saw Big Paul last night, alive as you and me. Says I, but Paul, you're ten years dead. I never died, says he. I never died, says he. I never died, says he. is for Queen Victoria. The Queen Victoria statue stands in Albert Square in the town centre just outside the McManus Galleries. Erected in 1897, it was the first monument of a woman within the city. Seen as an icon of her times, her statue has become a site of political resistance and controversy, however. From the jute strikers of the early 1900s, right up to the Black Lives Matter protests last year, the Queen Victoria statue often sits as a site where Dundonians express discontent and radicalism. As a site of power and privilege, it has often become a symbol of what is wrong with society for Dundonians. The recent Black Lives Matter protest brings this issue to a fore. Cities across the UK questioned why statues of seemingly iconic figures still stood proud within the cities when they were caught up in an empire that brutally suppressed black lives and culture. Dundee was not immune to this discussion as a local newspaper asked whether the Queen Victoria statue should be re-evaluated and readers questioned her role and openly connecting her with a quote, racist empire past. The opening of the v &A Museum also saw the Queen Victoria statue draped in a placard calling her the Famine Queen. Her overseeing of an empire and its role in causing hunger and starvation in India made her a very controversial figure for Dundee's modern left. An incident in the 1970s, however, perhaps encapsulates the left's relationship to the Queen Victoria statue, where she was vandalised with a can of red paint thrown all over her. Just a few years after 1968, the symbolism of the red and its revolutionary sentiment would not have been lost on the people of Dundee. No one ever found out who did this, though rumours were abound as to who did it. The trash can sonatras John Douglas immortalises the event in a following poem. What brown poet's eyes could secretly vandalise Victoria's old bronze coupon. While she's nae queen here, brown eyes had no fear. The deed's done, he's him, and fired a soup on. There's only six folk ken who did the dulux then. Seven, if you count Victoria. Well, your secret can bide, for there's nae clipes inside the People's Republic of Dundonia. R is for red. Like the paint on Queen Victoria, the red flags the international brigades marched under and the traditions of red and radical Dundee. R is for reform and for revolution. And Dundee has a long history of radical change because in 16th century Dundee, R was also for reformation. The Scottish Reformation sought to transform religion in the country. And once again, Dundee was at the center of this movement through the preaching of George Wishart. The Reformation was many things, but among Wishart's principles was a belief that worship should be for ordinary people and in the language of the people, and he believed in education for all. He denounced corruption in the existing church, and popular tradition says that when an outbreak of the plague meant people were banished 
removed from the city's limits to avoid transmission of the disease. Wishart leapt up on top of the arch of the city's gate and preached at the same time to those safely inside and those suffering outside, making sure that salvation was open to all. George Wishart was eventually killed for his efforts. He was garroted and burnt at the stake as a heretic in St Andrews in 1546. But the Reformation went on. In the 1560s, the Wedderburn brothers in Dundee published their book of good and godly ballads. And this was really the first book of its kind, introducing new ideas about religion. Psalms were translated from Latin into a language much closer to the Scots that folk spoke at home and in the streets. And even more shockingly, they had adapted popular traditional songs to religious themes. The book was controversial, but it was popular too. And by the turn of the 17th century, the ballads had become an important part of one of the biggest religious shifts Scotland has ever seen. In 1889, the poet James Young Geddes hailed the Reformation as part of Dundee's long radical tradition. Mine own town, dear old town, town with the unbroken radical history, town that ever stood first for reform and independence, town where Wallace declared the national freedom, town that stood for Knox and the Reformation, town where the tree of liberty was planted. And through that same poem, The Glory Has Departed, Geddes makes an important plea for the city not to rest on its laurels, reminding us that it is easy to let a radical history blind us to present inequalities. S. S is for school strikes. Instigated by Swedish school pupil Greta Thunberg in August 2018, pupils across the world went on Friday strikes demanding climate justice. Globally, millions of young people have participated in the youth climate strike action, including hundreds of pupils from Dundee. However, this wasn't the first time Dundee's pupils have got political. In 1971, hundreds of school children across Scotland organised to save the American cartoon Scooby-Doo from the BBC's acts. Earheaded by 12-year-old Dundonian Jimmy Brown, pupils walked out of school and marched to the offices of DC Thompson, despite the fact they had nothing to do with the cartoon. Needless to say, the campaign was successful and it saw Scooby-Doo reinstated shortly after. Another lesser known but much larger school strike reached its peak in Dundee on the 14th of September, 1911. Thousands of children from over 60 towns and cities across the UK went on strike, provoked by the caning of a pupil in Wales. Flying pickets helped to spread the news of strikes from town to town. Through the tight network of child labourers in Dundee, word spread rapidly and many were already familiar with industrial action through the earlier Cox's Mill strike that year. Many children were half-timers, working from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. three days a week in the hazardous mills, as well as going to school two days per week, sometimes working an additional shift on a Saturday. Their demands included less homework, possibly nay sums, and a half-day holiday per week. Many of the pupils of the 1911 strike went on to take part in the Duke Mill strike of 1912. An article the following day in the Paisley Express reads, eight schools involved in Dundee, a hundred school windows smashed. Rowdy scenes occurred in Dundee yesterday in connection with the strike of schoolboys. No fewer than eight schools were involved and it was calculated that by the afternoon, several thousand boys had mutinied. The trouble arose originally in Cowgate School where there was a breakaway in the morning and the leaders of the movement were observed to threaten others if they did not join in. The masters interviewed stated that they were unaware of any grievance while the boys declared that they wanted to be given fewer home lessons, more holidays and less of the strap. 
At 11 o'clock, the trouble seemed to be disappearing, a large section of the lads returning, and one of the leaders, who was subjected to corporal punishment, refused to advise a continuance. But the news of the strike had got abroad in the town, and at the dinner hour, there were defections from Wallace Town, Victoria Road, Blackness, Balfour Street, Hill Street, and Ann Street schools, and the boys paraded through the town and adopted various tactics to secure accessions to their ranks. Company of them paid a visit to the high school, Dundee's only private school, and armed with sticks and missiles, they created a demonstration. They did not, however, succeed in getting any recruits at this institution. In many instances, the parents of the boys interfered with a view to putting an end to the dispute, and one boy was marched back to school by his grandmother, who boxed his ears from time to time. T. T is for Timex dispute. Timex is an international watchmaking company founded in 1854 and it landed on Scotland's shores in 1947 when it set up its first factory in Dundee. By the 1960s, it had three huge manufacturing sites across the city and became Dundee's largest single employer by 1980s. Timex offered high-skilled, high-paid employment for a city that had often been plagued with low wages and acute poverty. In very Dundee style, however, it offered very female-centred work. 80% of all those employed were women. On Christmas Eve of 1992, Timex announced that it planned to lay off around 100 of its workforce. Activists at the time noted that trade unionists were specifically singled out for this, these layoffs and a call for strike action was made with 92% of the workforce in favour of strike action. It was a long protracted dispute lasting for eight months and not ending until Timex closed its doors in the August of 93. This was a bitter struggle for Dundee and still marks the city to this day. The 1980s brought significant poverty to Dundee again as the Thatcher years took grip. To lose an institution like Timex in what was seen as a cruel dismissal of the Dundee people caused a crisis within the city. Women were the sheer steering force behind this dispute, however. As the predominant workforce, they were the strength behind the struggle and that came from the striking women. As reflected by Timex worker and striker Mary McGregor, it wasn't just a factory closure. It was women, children and communities that were affected. And it was for this protection that the women fought tooth and nail. The Timex dispute was Dundee's most significant strike in its history and one of Scotland's most turbulent one. But for Mary McGregor, she wants the dispute to be known for the strength and resilience of the women. I want this strike to be remembered in terms of the bravery and the courage and the determination of those women on that picket line. They are what the dispute is about. They sum up Dundee. They sum up Dundee women. Don't cross us. You is for the goal of universal suffrage. And every extension of voting rights through the years has been hard fought for. In 1884, to demand the passing of the Third Reform Bill, the folk of Dundee took to the streets and the Madeline Green with an array of banners to make their feelings known. The Tay Bridge builders came with a banner saying, the arch of liberty cannot stand on rotten piers. The weavers held up a piece of cloth with the words, I'm nicely folded up and look so trim and neat. But if the Lords don't pass the bill, I'll be their winding sheet. Remember the hecklers from earlier? They cried, as flax is heckled, so we'll see. The House of Peers, the same shall be. The vote we'll have, and that's quite clear, in spite of Lords or Tory peer. The jute workers came with sacks labelled bag the Lords, Lords for export, should contain two million votes. The printers were there too. They said, 
We'll make blocks of the lords to print the bill and stamp them down with right good will. And the women from Maxwell Town Works came out with a working power loom model and their slogan was, women's rights I will maintain against both Whig and Tory. We'll hear female franchise now and end this hurry burry. It would be a good while before these women and many of their male colleagues got the vote. We've only had equal voting since 1928. It hasn't been a century. And are we there yet with universal suffrage? Come ye hardy sons of labour and press onwards to the fight. We'll show those Tory peers no favour till the peasants get their right. V. V is for David Vedder, an Arcadian poet, sailor and tide surveyor. Receiving very little education, he was orphaned at a young age and he went to sea at the age of 22, where he became the captain of a whaling ship. He mastered French, Italian and German and published his own collections of poems, as well as a popular memoir of Walter Scott. He resided in Dundee for some time where he recorded his observations of tidal movements. From Vedder's anthology, poems legendary, lyrical and descriptive, Tam Dean Byrne presents The Course of Dundee. The Course of Dundee by David Vedder. When France was beginning her noisy career, and setting the despots o' Europe a steer. Pray, wha has nae heard o' the muckle bumby that buzzed o' the bonnets o' bonny Dundee? They hide to a plantain and pood a young ash, as green as the holly, as straight as a rash. The calants they cursened at liberty's tree, and they planted it deep at the course o' Dundee. The baileys came running, clean out of their wit, and swearing like fiends frae the bottomless pit. They wad string to a lamppost where they might be we had planted that ash at the course o' Dundee. The constables threatened to skiver the mob. The deacons all thought it a very bad job. And they swore Robbie Spear and his myrmidons three would be dancing a reel at the course of Dundee. All Dougal Medoo, with a wild heel and grunt, she hewed at the tree till her halbert grew blunt. And she swore, suck an holly, and she never did see. Tad would tear be disgrace in ta course o' Dundee. But the provost was wise, and his word was a law. His finger had muckle mere sense than them all. Be canny, fool bodies. And touch na the tree that the lads he set up at the course of Dundee. It's Nathan but Daffin. The lads need a ploy. I'm sure if they like it, I'll wash them great joy. But he sent for the soldiers and camped on the lee. To clear with our muskets the course of Dundee. Bepladed and kilted, the Highlanders came, their bayonets gleaming, their blood in a flame. And in thirty five minutes, the bonny ash tree was lodged at the muckle black hole of Dundee. In double quick time did the Kilties career. The weavers and hecklers, they scampered like deer. The very old wives to their garrets did flee, and quietude reigned 
at the coast of Dundee. But a wee party bridey, a barber by trade, his vera best bow to the provost he made. We are lang leave your honour, just give me the tree, nay mere it shall stand at the course of Dundee. The provost was sharp, but the provost was shrewd. He liked not to needlessly anger the crude. Gay till the black hole, and tack out the bit tree, and ne'er let me see it at the course of Dundee. The barber had prudence, and when it was dark, they planted the tree in a bonny green park. And there it has flourished since ninety and three, revered by the bonnets, O oh bonny Dundee. W. W is for Fanny Wright. Fanny Wright was a Dundee-born American social reformer and pioneer for the cause of equality. A writer, lecturer, public speaker and playwright, she spoke out for women's rights and became Ameri the first American woman to publicly speak out against slavery. In a very Dundonian style, Fanny lived her life very much on her own terms, taking innovative and imaginative paths in the struggle for emancipation. Born in 1795, from a young age, she swore to wherever in her heart the cause of the poor and the helpless. Her visit to the US in 1818 was her turning point. Their emerging democracy inspired her and she used America's democratic experiments as a template for advocating reform in the UK when she returned. Fanny moved to the US a few years later where she spoke out against slavery again purchased 13 miles of land and set up Nashoba, an attempt to create a utopian society that helped prepare slaves for freedom. Inspired by Robert Owen's socialist community, Fanny's vision was to emancipate slaves through peaceful means. Unfortunately, it failed and the egalitarian commune she imagined collapsed three years later. But Fanny continued regardless, embracing and promoting freedoms in almost any guise. She took all chances to promote social reform and experimented in strategies to give freedom wherever she could. Promoting socialism through her journal with Robert Owen, she was an advocate of, of universal suffrage as well as slave emancipation. She was also an adv advocate of sexual freedom, birth control and divorce rights for women. Fanny was a woman who literally did not confine herself to the social conventions of her time and tried to break all confines of society, both personally as well as politically. When she died in 1852, she was buried in Cincinnati and at her own request on her gravestone is the words she wrote herself. I have wedded the cause of human improvement, staked on it my fortune, my reputation and my life. X is for XR, or Extinction Rebellion, a contemporary movement formed to demand climate justice. In January 2020, three protesters who called themselves the Rig Rebels, including a Dundee woman known only as Alison, occupied an oil rig in Dundee docks. You can see the danger in a wildfire or a monsoon, but for some reason people don't see the danger in an oil rig. Fossil fuels are the main drivers of the climate and ecological emergency that we're facing. 
just realised how much is at stake. What's kind of spurred me to action was um, when my, my niece Ivy was born, when she's old enough to realise what is actually going on. We could be, you know, living in a world that's beyond repair. If we only have a little bit of time left to do anything, I'm going to give it my best shot. Um, and then I can look her in the eye and tell her, you know, we tried. Extinction Rebellion activists have occupied a gas rig at Dundee Port in protest over climate change. Three women scaled the giant vessel at lunchtime. I don't feel like I have much of a choice but to do something that directly impacts the industry because the government isn't, isn't doing their job and they're not doing something about it. We need to see the bigger picture here of like multinational companies just like profiting off the destruction of our planet, then I was getting distracted <laughs> by trying to recycle more. No, this is, this is systemic stuff that's happening and we need to wake up to it and we need to stop it. Fossil fuels receive $10 million a minute in subsidies. A fraction of that money could be used to have fair green jobs and to allow us to live in a way that preserves human dignity and the environment. The Industrial Revolution um, started in the UK. So we were the ones who started pumping huge amounts of CO2. I feel responsible for what happens here in Scotland and I'm really furious um, with the Scottish Government, their excuses for continuing to drill for oil and gas. I mean, it's criminal really. There just needs to be a red line, like no digging, no extracting, no more oil, no more new exploration of the North Sea. No more licences for oil exploration. We need to leave every single drop in, in the ground. The government are being so hypocritical. Um, they're telling us that we've got leading policy on climate change globally um, and that they're working hard on it and doing their best. And it's just... It's a bunch of lies. We can't just wait for a conscientious politician to make a good decision. Why? Why is for Yes City. In 2014, Scotland went to the polls and asked itself a core fundamental question regarding its future. Do you want to be an independent country? Scotland decided to remain part of the UK, but Dundee voted overwhelmingly to become independent. With 58% of Dundonians voting yes, the highest pro-independence vote in Scotland, Dundee has now gained the reputation and name of Yes City. 2014 changed Scotland's trajectory, however. Two years later, the UK voted Brexit, but Scotland's overwhelming desire to remain, and with Dundee very much part of this, made Brexit one of the biggest factors for Scotland's slow rethinking of the independence question. Scotland has seen its main pro-independence party, the SNP, in power in the Scottish Parliament for 14 years now. And as Scotland goes to the polls in May, they are expected to win a fourth term with an increased majority. And that majority brings an expected, and some would say almost inevitable, revisit of the constitutional question, should Scotland be an independent nation? In 2014, Dundee took the leap of faith towards independence, a leap that Scotland itself was not quite ready to make. But it's no surprise that it was Dundee that did this. Dundee's history, as we've seen, is often about taking a different path, rejecting the icon of Winston Churchill for a prohibitionist, for instance. It's a city that's embraced change and stood at the centre of that change. The bread riots, the liberty tree or the jute strikes, the suffragettes and other radical movements. When political and social change occurs, Dundee is usually there somewhere making it happen. Most of tonight has looked at Dundee's role in time of great social change. And in 2021, we sit in the midst of even more seismic international change. Scotland is part of this, but we have our own unique revolutions occurring 
and we're still trying to work through what those changes mean for Scotland. No one knows what the future holds for Scotland at this uncertain period. But one thing is probably certain, that no matter what path we take, Dundee with its history of radicalism will likely be at the centre of the change that comes. Z. Z is for Generation Z. Born between 1996 and 2010, they are the largest living generation and they have grown up with digital culture. So perhaps tonight's history class is really to inspire them. On average, Generation Z reads less books, but they are more educated. They are more stressed, but more well-behaved. They have more allergies and are highly aware of mental health problems. They will be the generation whose future is impacted most by the pandemic, yet it has been cited that 90% of young people in the UK currently feel ignored by politicians and scientists when addressing the impact of COVID. Many are understandably feeling concerned and uncertain about their future, their education, their families, and the renewed sense of exclusion and inequality the pandemic has brought with it. How will this generation that's grown up with the burgeoning climate change and Black Lives Matter movements fight the complex problems of the post-pandemic world? Perhaps Generation Z's mass organizational skills and sense of connectedness could be a ray of optimism in these dark times. As Mary Brooksbank completed her biography in 1968, she also found faith in the spirit of youth. She said, I have no doubt that life could have been much easier if I had bowed my head to the storm, but I am not alone. There are signs of a great awakening, particularly among the young. We are in the throes of a world revolution. It can have but one outcome, to end the exploitation of man by man, to end forever the darkness of superstitious fears, to end forever the mass orgies of murderous wars. Although tonight's event has been a history class, it was not simply about looking backwards, but looking backwards at people who dared to look forwards. People who have had the boldness to not only imagine a different type of future, but also to create it. As we reach the end of our alphabet, we have one final reading. Poppy Page recites Forward from Brooks Banks' collection, Sidlaw Breezes. Come out from your darkness, into the light. Shake off these ancient illusions, shoulder to shoulder square up to the fight. Free your minds from your primal delusions. Why must you continue to poke in the mud and dirty yourselves with the glore? You whose claim is you're the image of God. Was this all he created you for? From the slough and slime of the social pit, standing erect like men, holding aloft the torch new lit, we are ready when you say when. Outbrave the dim of their jungle roar, drown its noise with your laughter. This surely was what you were created for, to make this here a hereafter. To make this here, a hereafter, what a powerful note to conclude the rich and the invigorating journey that Ruth, Erin, Schwang, Hussein, John and all our other contributors took us on. So thank you all. This A to Z of Dendonian descent articulates the necessity of acknowledging the importance of history in what the ignorant art school is doing and why it's happening now. So resonating throughout this undertaking is a tumult of inspiring, defined voices, which tell us one enduring truth, that knowledge is always a collective experience. So with that in mind, I wish to begin my brief commentary by celebrating the emotional and intellectual generosity, which rings loud in the thinking of writer, feminist, and activist, Audre Lorde, who called out to us all when she said, I quote, when I speak of change, I don't mean a simple switch of positions or a temporary lessening of tensions, nor the ability to smile or feel good. 
I am speaking of a basic and a radical alteration in those assumptions underlying our lives. End of quote. So, and the, it is knowledge, the assumptions we make on its complexities of what it is or isn't, how it's formed, mediated and shared as a social act, how knowledge bears the pressure, the violence of authority and the power. It is all this and the more that the ignorant art school takes as the ethical landscape in which we gather as a caring community, as a collaborating collective that sees equality as a practice rather than an ideal. As a site of building communities of resistance and care, the ignorant art school categorically disputes that knowledge is the province of the specialist, the master, the informed, or the wise. Here in this school, knowledge is the means of enabling potential and ultimately the freedom of thought and deed. So this revolutionary potential of education is exemplified by feminist writer and activist Bell Hooks when she wrote, I quote, in that field of possibility, we have the opportunity to labor for freedom, to demand of ourselves and our comrades an openness of mind and heart that allows us to face reality, even as we collectively imagine ways to move beyond boundaries, to transgress. This is education as the practice of freedom. So I am regularly asked since the publication of this project, why is it an ignorant art school? So the title of this project is inspired by French thinker Jacques Rancière's seminal book, The Ignorant Schoolmaster, in which Rancière recounts the story of Joseph Jacot, an exiled uh, French school teacher who in 1818 formulated a teaching method that dissolved hierarchies in conventional pedagogical practice by stressing learning as a process of doing, not explanation. So this notion of ignorant also draws an inspiration from feminist critic, Gayatri Spivak, when she described her work as a stream of learning of how to unlearn and what to unlearn. So in this sense, to be ignorant is to be in a state of pure potential, a state of readiness of being always on the cusp of the new, the radical and the revolutionary. Espousing this as its ethos, the ignorant art school occupies an institutional space traversed by tensions. It is a school that doesn't offer solutions or answers, but instead a revolutionary reimagining of what we think we want it to be. To connect with the broader social concerns, embed plural voices, and most importantly, an ethic of distributed agency. At the heart of this approach, the Ignorant Art School will invite an associate occupier to reflect and contribute to the ongoing process of each sitting exhibition and the curriculum. For sitting number one, we have invited writer and researcher Hussein Misa to be the inaugural associate occupier. So between now and the end of April, we have a series of gatherings facilitated by artists, designers, writers, activists, historians, singers, and social critics. And the sitting curriculum number one, which began with today's history class. Following this will be two play classes, a reading class, a strike class, a beauty class, a slogan class, even a radical pop crawl amongst others. So all of these will be online until Ruth's exhibition opens in the gallery on the 2nd of September, when the further and ideally hope a face-to-face -face curriculum will be delivered alongside the exhibition in Cooper Gallery. So once again, on behalf of the Ignorant Art School, I would like to say a big thank you to Ruth and to all our contributors of this evening for their dissenting and generous voices. We would also like to thank all of you who are just a, a screen away for being our classmates this evening. 
I would like to take this opportunity to thank our partners of this uh, history class, the local history center at Dundee Libraries, our ever supportive colleagues at the Jordanstone College of Art and Design, University of Dundee, and our funders, Creative Scotland and the Henry Moore Foundation. So we hope this evening has been a stimulating one and we will be thrilled to see you all again soon. Coming up next Wednesday will be a play class and learning for freedom number one, which will be set in motion by John McCann. Hussain will facilitate a reading class entitled Proletarian Art, Proletarian Culture on the following Thursday, 11th of March. So thank you once again, good night and see you soon. Well wow.